Hi, I'm Joe Quirk. Welcome to the Blue Frontiers podcast about all my favorite things, seasteading, the environment, special economic zones, and innovation in science, technology, governance, and society itself. Chen Ming Wang is one of the leading very large floating structure experts in the world. He's from Singapore. He's advised us over the years, telling us, you still need to do this and you still need to do that. And then at the first Tahitian seasteading gathering, he said, I'm really proud of you. That was one of the most satisfying moments of my life. Enjoy your conversation with Chen Ming Wang. Hello, sisters. I'm here with Professor Wong. He is a Transport and Main Roads Chair Professor in Structural Engineering. How are you, Professor Wang? I'm very fine, thank you, Natalie. Good to see you. Yes, it's okay. a beautiful day today to speak on floating structures. <laughs> and I'm keeping you inside. <laughs> oh. All right. So, Professor Wang, what is the difference between a very large floating structure and a not so large floating structure? Oh, well, that is very much uh, to do with the size, the dimensions. Okay. If you have a very, very large floating structures, uh, uh, we are talking about, you know, in hundreds of, uh, of meters in length, uh, at least, minimally. Uh, yeah. So these, are, these, these structures, which are huge, provides a lot of stability and a lot of uh, uh, inertia against uh, wave action. So they are ideal to create um, artificial land on the sea. Yes. Whereas the small floating structures, they are obviously susceptible to a lot of pitching motion, uh, rolling and, and surge, as well as heaving, because uh, it is so small, it, it kind of pops up and down together with the, with the waves. Oh. But when you are very, very large, the waves become very, very small compared to the structure. And they are like ripples, like small little ripples on the, on the, on the structure. Yes. So oh. the effect of, of wave motion is, is pretty much uh, reduced dramatically. Oh. If you stand on a very, very large floating structures, you wouldn't feel that you're on the sea uh -huh. at all. You feel no. like you're on land, you know? Yeah. I saw that you went to a floating structure in Japan that is one kilometer long length and the yes. width is from 60 meters to 100 meters. Yes. How do they make it change the width like that from 60 to 100? Oh, okay. Uh, you're referring to the mega float, which yes. the Japanese built in the year uh, of between 1995 to 2000. Yes. To, to investigate the feasibility of a floating airport. So wow. the Japanese built this uh, mega float from steel. And uh, what they did was oh. they, they, they created modules of them in different shipyards. And they are taught to site and assemble uh, on the sea by welding. They oh. weld the, the pieces together. So when they come in different sizes. As they weld together, they can come to any shape that you so wish. In fact, uh, the speed in which the construction of this one kilometer long uh, uh, floating runway, test runway, surprises me and a lot of people because they're able to do it within a couple of months due to the simultaneous construction wow. of different parts of the floating structure at the same time. If you look at a building on land, they are built in sequential. You've got to build the... Yes. the, the you have to build the uh, foundation first and then you build the structure on top of it. So everything in sequence. But for a floating structure, you can build everything together at the same time. Oh. You can build the, the modules as well as the mooring system at the same time. You don't have to wait for one, one uh, um, component before you build the other component. So they, that, that speeds up the construction of very large floating structures. Wow. And that would be very good for monetizing the, your... Uh, return of investment, you know, uh, speed up the return investment. Yeah, you can start operation immediately. Why do you think Japan is so prone and so open to very large floating structures? Because I saw that they even have a large floating structures association. Mm. Yes. Well, Japan, as you know, is a is an island nation. It's yes. surrounded by ocean and seas. 
And interestingly, the Japanese are, are not equally distributed throughout the whole uh, country of Japan. Their, their population are concentrated in, in, in cities. And most of the cities are on coastal, on the a, on a coastlines. Okay. Yeah. So as a result, um, the land prices uh, skyrocket as more and more people move towards city. So although you have land, um, you, you are not utilizing your land in an evenly manner. Everybody is concentrated in a place. And when the land cost goes up so much higher, then putting um, uh, housing, peers, leisure activities and so on on the sea makes sense. Because these days, the cost of building a, a floating platform is approximately US $100 per, uh, per square. Um, really? Uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's right. So, that's really so, cheap. Yeah. So, so if your land is, is much, much more expensive, it would mean that uh, you know, it's cheaper to go on the, yes. on the sea. <laughs> yeah. exactly. so, so, so things are, are, are changing as a result of demand. Uh, as, as there's a greater demand for the city space and city is being constricted, um, things will flow onto the, onto the coastline, uh, onto the sea or rivers or lakes. Uh, uh, for just purely economic reasons. And besides floating, landing, airports, what other examples are there for very large floating structures? Because I've seen yes. hotels, restaurants, um, mm. docks, theaters. Mm. What else mm. can we do floating? Yeah. Well, apart from all that... Uh, diverse applications you have just mentioned. You know, I'm amazed that every day I read about some, <laughs> somewhere, someone thought of a great idea or have already built some of these uh, large floating structures for all kinds of applications. One of the incredible things recently I read was that they built a, uh, a, a kind of a surfing dock uh, for surfers to, to run along this uh, along this uh, floating structure and jump into the waves while it's running. Well, uh, so it's, like a, it's, a, it's like a launching pack for surfers uh, <laughs> who wants to, <laughs> to catch the wave. So they wait, they wait on, the, on, the, on the floating platform. The floating platform are very, very flexible. So they wait. So when the wave comes, of course, it, 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 yeah, it cool. creates. Right? So when they wait, they run along, they run along this, this, this uh, flexible wow. floating uh, platform. And then they, at the end of it, they jump out into the, into the wave and is right on, on the wave. Another interesting thing is that Germans built the, what we call the floating, uh, the first floating um, uh, surf pool, you know, for surfing. They create, yes. Instead of swimming pool, swimming pool for swimming, they created a pool for surfing. So I'm there floating. is this, yeah. So these Whoa. waves cut, you know, they put it out in the, in the, in the uh, you know, in the, in the uh, sea. Oh. So you, you pump the, the, the sea uh, water and then create this wave and then they are surfing inside there. Even though there is no surf outside, you know, complete <laughs> calm, but inside the pool you can surf. Wow. So you can surf all year round. That's uh, amazing. That one, yeah, I mean, uh, New York City uh, have built a floating okay. prison. A prison, a floating prison. They can put about 870 inmates in there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, floating prison is fantastic. You can't escape. <laughs> no, <laughs> well. in the middle of the ocean, you can't escape. And wow. uh, of course, um, yeah, uh, I I think you know Rotterdam has built a floating dairy farm. Yeah, that's yes. exciting. Um, South Africa has built a, a floating uh, bicycle track in India in, oh. in bicycle wow. their bicycle um, uh, race. So they, they let the, the mountainous um, uh, oh mount, uh, the mountain uh, riders uh, on the motorcycle or, or bicycle, uh, and then they go down to the lake. And then while on the lake, they, they cycle on this, this very, very narrow path, floating path, Beautiful. and create a very exciting uh, track for them. Yeah. You can also do, um, you know, uh, China create a boardwalk. Uh, yes, longer, two you... times the, the length of Manhattan, and uh, they brought wow. a lot of visitors there. So it's endless. I mean, they, they keep on thinking about new things of doing things. Maldives is creating a, a, a eighteen hole golf course, a floating golf course. Wow. Uh, Singapore is thinking of uh, of storing fuel in the sea. 
creating floating fuel storage facility and bunker supply system based. Uh, the Japanese have caught even a, a skyscraper on a floating platform, a one kilometer, they call it the, the green float. Um, it's beautiful. If you go uh, to the website, uh, you can yeah. Google for uh, the green float. You can see this humongous one kilometer tall skyscraper. Of course, the base must be three kilometers. So, uh, so you, you get stability and they already designed it and uh, it's got approval uh, from the classification society and uh, they can build anytime. If, if you want to build a smaller version of it because it is too, <laughs> too, too high, you can have a, a smaller version. They can scale it down for you. And it would be great. Actually, actually, Natalie, if I got money, I would love to you know, purchase such a, <laughs> a, a lot of money. All of us form a consortium and, and create this, this beautiful floating city <laughs> out there. And uh, I think a lot of people will flock to that place. It's going to be a, 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 a attractive magnet to pull everybody in. Yeah, yeah. That's so floating structures has a, a lot, a lot of possibilities to, you know, uh, we can use floating structures uh, to clean our, our, our sea environment. Yes. Uh, we can use floating structures, farm fish, uh, create uh, jobs. We can do a lot of things. Yeah. Wow. Except the imagination. Yeah. <laughs> I know another very cool use that you didn't mention and is related to you actually. So I know you have a 60 million Australian dollars grant from the Australian oh. Research Council. No, not, not 60 million, 600. 600, is. sorry, 600, yes, 600. Yes. So, uh, we are looking at, yes, um, I got uh, this, uh, they call it discovery project. Um, which uh, the Australian Research Council, they give funding for some interesting ideas, some, uh, <laughs> some novel ideas. So I, uh, we propose creating a floating forest. I love uh, it. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and why do you want to do that? Because <laughs> as, we, as we notice that a lot of, whenever I, I, I look at news, I notice that when there's a storm coming, the storm is usually characterized by high, high waves and very strong winds. Yes. And what do people do? They just hunker down. They, they bought up their houses they, yes. and, and they go down to the basement and they pray and they, or they evacuate <laughs> the city. They couldn't do anything. They just, no. just, just stay where they are, hunker down and, and hope for the best. Yes. Not myself. I thought to myself, why should we be <laughs> at this mercy of this nature? Can we do something about it? Oh. You know, our, you, if you look at the port terminals, um, when there's a very strong uh, storm, uh, strong winds of more than 40, 50 meters per second wind, you can see these containers are lifted up, literally the empty containers lifted up and they're thrown like matchboxes, you know, all over the place. And okay. imagine, um, yeah, and the, the pot has to be shut down for, for days because, you know, all the, they have to clear the, wow. the containers and so on and the stacking up has to be secured before they can uh, receive further uh, containers from ships. That's a loss of, a great loss of money. So wow. I thought that perhaps if we can reduce somehow the, 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 wave, the wave height and wave energy, as well as the wind uh, speed, bring it down to a manageable level, not to cancel it completely, but to reduce it to, uh, to a level that, that we can, that our system on land, on shore, and on beaches, and so on, can handle those kind of wind wow. speed and wave, uh, wave height. Then uh, we could uh, we could get away with uh, you know worrying about being destroyed or being uh, uh, get damaged uh, uh, as well as loss of um, of the economy and so on. So I was I was thinking then we need we need a wave we need a, a floating breakwater to break the waves. Yes. But we also need a windbreaker at the same time. Yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an artificial forest. I know it. it. <laughs> at the same time, create a, a novel uh, floating breakwater to break the wave. I know. Then I'm going to put the forest on top of my <laughs> floating breakwater so wow. that I can get, I can, I can break the, the, the wave and also I can break the wind. I so know. if we can do both things, then uh, we could survive this storm. And, and why shouldn't we do that, you know? Uh, we have the technology to do so. 
so I'm looking at the ways of doing it. Uh, I do have some design, conceptual design, but uh, uh, that is still in, in its infancy. Uh, we are testing it out, doing numerical simulation and also model testing. And we hope to file a patent for such a, a floating forest. So, I know. Uh, Natalie, you'll be first to, to see it when uh, finally I have finally sorted out the, all, the, all the technical aspects of it. Yeah. Really? So we are, we are discussing about it as well with the Koreans and also with, the, with my fellow uh, uh, colleagues uh, who is a wind expert and also the Koreans who are both wind as well as uh, a wave, uh, wave experts. So we are trying to, to uh, improve on, the, on our, our concept plans and, and see how we best do it in the most economical way. Okay? I yeah. love it. Do you think it'll be finished by May? Uh, no, not that. <laughs> we, we, we were given this uh, four years to, to finish this project. We have, uh, we have passed one year. So the concept is, is already uh, um, uh, the first stage, uh, the first version of this floating forest is already wow. taught through. And uh, we have proven that it can reduce wave and wind. Uh, but what we would like to do is to find it, uh, we want to optimize it and get it more cost effective. And okay. we still have to figure out the mooring system, how best to use, uh, what kind of mooring system to hold the floating forest in place. So, uh, it will be located uh, in the coast of Australia, of course, right? Yeah. Because it's from yes. the Australia, yeah, Australia, but a very, very long coastline. So it is pounded by the Pacific Ocean waves. And it, it, when, you, when you are here next month, you yes. will go to Gold Coast and enjoy this beautiful, one of the most beautiful yes. features in the world. The, ah! the surface paradise. And what we are facing is that um, uh, sometimes these beaches, uh, they can be completely uh, uh, destroyed in the sense of being carved out completely. You, you, the, the, the whole entire beach can vanish in a big storm. Now, when you have a town that is so dependent on on, on the beach for survival to draw the uh, you know, tourists and, and, and all peoples of all parts of Australia to that particular location. If you lose your beach, you lose your attraction immediately. Yeah. And that would mean a great loss in the economy of that town. So they, they have to rebuild the beach. Each time it's been washed out. Whoa. They have to carry sand and bring it back and, and, and really? create the whole entire beach. Yes. Otherwise, there's no beach. There's no fun. <laughs> there's, there's no fun of that. No beach. So wow. every hotels, every shops, and all that depends on the beach to survive. So oh. we can have a a floating forest to to mitigate or, or to reduce the the wave forces impacting on the beach. We can make the beach survive. You know, even in the greatest storm uh, wow. event. Yes, and also our our ports. Uh, in Brisbane port and so on, they're subjected to high winds. And each time they come up high winds, they, you know, we have, uh, there's a lot of damage. Yes. Uh, not only the roofs are blown out, the containers are all thrown aside. Wow. So we can also protect our, our ports. That'd be good as well. So that's, that's the idea, not only in Australia, but many, many parts of the world like Bangladesh. If you look at Bangladesh, there's a lot of people, um, uh, perish during a very very big storm because the waves oh. goes right through not only uh, the beaches but they go on top of the beaches all the low lying areas because it's very flat in, in in the in the Bengal area and 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 a lot of things are destroyed people are destroyed homes are flooded now if we can we can maybe even mitigate fifty percent of this damage is tremendous amount of savings not only of, of property, but of lives, you know, and Taiwan, for example, Taiwan is buffeted by a lot of big typhoons coming uh, from Philippines. They form it and they move towards Taiwan. So the, the coastline is always, always uh, hit by such a strong wind and they destroy a lot of things and people die too because of flying debris. So if we can, you can mitigate the wind for, for example, if you can bring a, a wind from 50 meters per second wind down to 30 meter per second wind, uh, then we'll, everything will survive because all structures are designed for 30 meter per second wind, but not, not, not many structures are designed for 50 meter per second wind. 
not many structures can survive. So 30 meters per second wind, if we can get it to that, to that wind speed, we should be, we should be okay. And uh, floating forest, we have, we have done the preliminary analysis and yes, we can get down to about 30 meters per second wind, about 50 meters per second wind. So, wow. so we are hopeful. I love it. How about the biodiversity? How will you decide which species to populate the floating forest with? Oh, these floating forests are not, uh, are not organic uh, uh, trees or whatever that we are, or plants. These are actually uh, tree-like um, concrete structures. They, 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 are just, they are just like, um, you know, tubes that comes out from the surface oh. of the floating water, but we call it trees, kind of, in oh. inverted commas. So they, they, they form obstacles, barriers, green barriers. And they are, they, are, they are made of angular sections to create a lot of turbulence to dissipate the energy. And their, and their surface is rough. We, so we do not make it smooth or circular. We make it purposely the other way around, rough. And rough. So we call it trees, but it's like a man-made kind of forest in a way. Okay. It's, not, it's not natural grown uh, forest trees, but okay. artificial forest. Artificial forest. Maybe yeah. they, can do, they can be painted in a way that they, it's like an art installation and people... Oh, yeah, yes, you can. Yes, you can make it, you can beautify it and you can make it look organic look and so on. But essentially, they are uh, concrete. Um, or it could be made of, you know, um, uh, steel or they can be made uh, from very um, high-density polyethylene or some materials, man-made materials and they shape into uh, whatever configuration that will, that will cause a lot of uh, dissipation of wind energy as, as the wind passes through. Yes. So the computer simulations that you are doing is to test with, which shapes? Uh, yeah, we like to find out how the trees structure look like, how they should be spaced apart, you know, how, what, is the, what is the width we should have, be having, things like that. I know it. Yeah. Yes. So you mentioned beaches. There's also a case in Norway of a floating beach. Yes, in Sorenja. In Sorenja, in, in, the, in, the, in the city of Oslo, um, there was an old uh, warehouse area okay. and nobody okay. used it actually. And um, until so the developer took hold of this area with the blessing of the, of the uh, uh, city council, they, they built a, a new condominium and they could increase their, their plot ratio if they create more land. So they created this beach to allow them to build more apartments. And the apartments uh, actually um, are very, very attractive to the Norwegians because um, they like to, to be where the young professionals are located. So these are all young yappies, they call it. Okay. And they stay there. And then because there's a beach, it adds another attraction. Oh, cool. To, uh, so this, this artificial beach is just a pontoon uh, with, uh, with sand and there is, it enclosed a sea space in which they can swim during summer. Yeah. And to, to, to the Norwegians, uh, it is a, you know, it's a pleasure to be able to swim in a sea um, because it generally is cold most of the time. So yes. in summer, they love <laughs> to be if they can. That's why you see a lot of Norwegians they flock down to, to the southern part of uh, Europe for, and uh -huh. also to see the, the light, the, 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 the sunny weather. But if you've got a beach in front of your house, oh, fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> you can just, I know yeah. it. Yes, which is quite rare in, in, in Norway. So that is another noble idea of the use of floating structures to create floating beaches. And floating underwater tunnels, which they are also going to build in Norway. I think it's oh, yes. the Arab yes. I don't yes. know how to pronounce it. Yeah. Very in the okay. most of North. Okay. Mm. I will I will describe to you. Uh, you know the Norwegians are building a one thousand three hundred thirty kilometers E thirty nine highway from the northern part of uh, of Norway, uh, and and this highway will go that along the Atlantic coastline all okay. the way down to southern part to Elborg. So th this 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 oh. particular long highway. They call it E39 highway, have to pass through many fjords, many, yes. many fjords. Now, of course, how to get through a, a, a fjord? 
you can use a suspension bridge uh, was one possibility, but a suspension bridge has been tall enough for the for the cruise ship to pass by. Yes. Or you can use a um, a ferry to to bring you across, but the ferry is slow and you know yes. can only take a certain number of cars. Yes. Um, or you can build a subsea tunnel. That means a tunnel that you you dig underneath the the, the fjord seabed underneath and then go up. But then to build such a subsea tunnel you need to have a very long road tunnel because you cannot just go down very fast. The gradient is too steep for the motorists. You need, you need a gentle gradient. So that means you, take, you must take more and more land on either side to, 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 to make the gradient um, uh, allowable for cars safely to go down, right? But this is very costly. But you can shorten this tunnel if you, instead of going down under the seabed, you, you go through the... The, the fjord at some <laughs> at some specific height from the surface. Oh. All right. So this tunnel can be it is floating, uh, but it's submerged. Why is it submerged? Is because you want the cruise ship to pass by freely. So he must be below the 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 draft of the of, of the of the cruise ship. Wow. So he must go below, but not well below, so that they are in a position now. To keep it in position, they have to use tethers. These are uh, cables that hold it down and anchor to the, to the fjord's seabed okay. to keep it in position. Alternatively, if they make it heavy, they can sus suspend this floating tunnel using floaters, floaters on top. So there are floaters like, uh, like you know, uh, rectangular uh, blocks that are uh, completely uh, void so that they can have this uh, buoyancy force. And then you have a a cable that's attached to this to your floating tunnel. So the floating tunnel is suspended. I know. In, 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 you know. So there's, there's a new concept. And I believe, I believe, they haven't built yet, but I believe they're going to adopt this concept because it is very cost effective. And they have done a lot of work in, um, in Sintef and uh, Marintech as well in, for testing this floating, uh, um, they call it submerged uh, tunnel, road tunnel. Uh, they, they're going to do it and they have all the technology and the know-how to do it. So I'm excited. One yeah. of these days you'll see the news uh, being broadcast that Norway, Norway is going to do this. I yeah. am going there in January to Long oh. Yar. How do you pronounce it? Uh, Long Yang Burn. Yeah, that's the area Yang where they, yes. they, they take people from there to go and look at the Northern Lights. Yes. 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 So they're going to build a, a floating... Um, I, I believe a cruise terminal mm -hmm. there or the a cruise ship. Yeah. Yes. But you know, the, the, the Norwegians are, are experts in floating structures because they have been, they have been contending with the sea for a long, long time. Yes. You know, they, they, they are able to extract hydrocarbon uh, from very, very great depths and they have built uh, subsea um, structures and also the, one of the largest um, platforms called the trolls. They are about 300 meters high in concrete and they move them, float it out. And, and it's, it's a gigantic sight to see such a 300 meters of, wow. of concrete tower floating on, on, on the fjords okay. as they pass to the location that they put in the North Sea. And that's where uh, they put the platform on top and then they, they will drill for oil and then they use the, the big... Um, uh, columns that they have for storing oil in there, so it's wow. very, very, well, very, very creative. Yeah, I would, I, I can, I can wow. see the, 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 you know, the, the passion of the Norwegians wow. to try to, yeah, to use floating structures, and they're using floating structures now to farm the salmons. And you know, the salmons right now they are farmed in fjords. They use a circular floater, and then they have a net. Type. Uh, a net and they put a, a salmon in, in the net and farm it. Okay. But while they're farming the salmon, what happens is that they're also farming sea lice. And these sea lice are a nuisance, a pest. It sticks to the gills of the, of the salmon and they suck the blood of the salmon, rendering the salmon almost like half dead and, or, or if oh. not dead. You know? And they are losing a lot of salmon. The salmon production is dropping because of the sea lice. So what they're doing now over there is to build concrete tanks and then, and then pump water uh, 14 meters below the water surface. 
okay. which do not contain any sea lice because the sea lice only on the surface. So they pick okay. this, this about this water from 40 meters uh, below uh, the water surface into the tanks continuously and they farm the fish inside the concrete tanks. Okay. So now a lot of them from offshore industry because of the collapse of the oil and gas industry, a lot of them moves in into doing all this fish farming, aquaculture. Now, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they are the, the number one uh, uh, product that uh, is been exported out from uh, Norway. It's actually salmon. Yes, salmon is the, 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 the main to, yes. uh, exporting uh, produce. Uh, so they are going in a big way. In fact, uh, they are look, looking into offshore, completely offshore floating fish farm. They built a gigantic cage Putting, putting this cage about 40 kilometers off from the shoreline so there's no sea lice over there. And then they are, they are farming using some kind of uh, automation. Everything is self-automated and know. You know, they feed the fish and all that stuff. And, oh. and, they, are going to, and they, are, they are going to build, if successful, they will build a lot of this giant fish cage all over and farm it out in the open ocean which gives you better water quality and the, the fish Unhappy. will be stronger and, and yeah it has better nutrients and and they don't swim in the waste because if you farm in the fjords after a while mm. you know you swim in your own waste because it's contained the, the, yes. the, you don't have flushing of your of your entire net yeah so i think the norwegians are, are setting a trend uh for this fish farming so a lot of people will be observing them and see and see how successful they are and if it's successful I think there'll be a great demand for such a, a floating uh, offshore floating fish farms. I think so because if the main global exporter of salmon does it people yes. will definitely follow. Yes. Wow so uh, I know that there are two types of floating structures we've mentioned already different examples of both mm -hmm. Can mm -hmm. you tell us which is the difference between the semi-submersible ones and the pontoon ones? Yeah, okay. So, yes, uh, you can categorize floating structures into two types, the float, pontoon type and the semi-submersible type. Uh, in the semi-submersible type, is you put a platform, it's raised, the platform is raised above the sea level using column tubes uh, that gives the ballast. And they are usually raised above the maximum wave height uh, okay. in addition to your maximum payload so they can work out what should be the height it should be elevated from the oh, from the okay. surface so even though put a maximum load and the, and the maximum wave height occurs at that point you are still you have you are still above the water level you do not want to have this water slamming oh. on the deck <laughs> Because they will ruin your things and so on. So, so that's a semi-submersible. Uh, they are usually uh, deployed in uh, deployed in very high sea area where the seas are much rougher. But if you are putting a floating structure in a very very calm uh, uh, sea state condition, very benign sea state condition where the wave uh, height is not more than you know two two meters or so, um, then you can just put a pontoon type of floating structure which is just the whole platform just resting on, on, on the water surface. So, um, so for example, like the sea stating, you're looking at uh, your, yeah, your, uh, your floating island in Tahiti, inside a lagoon, you don't need to use a semi-submersible, a floating pontoon no. device, yeah. And so any, any, any sea state uh, condition that's benign in a, in a, in a harbour area, in a cove, in a lagoon, uh, or in a lake, you know, uh, floating structures should not be necessary on the sea. It can be any water body in a river, in in a, on a uh, in a lake. Yes. Well, you can use a pontoon type, yeah, which will suffice, and it's cheaper. You don't need the column tubes, ballast, and it's and the whole floating platform rests evenly on on the water surface. I yeah. love it. And what type of mooring systems are there to sustain mm. them in place? Okay, yes, uh, a key, one of the key uh, components of a very large floating structure system is the station keeping system. The station keeping system restrains uh, the floating structure in the horizontal direction, in the horizontal plane. 
In other words, okay. we do not let the floating structures to move freely anyhow it likes yeah. along the water surface. <laughs> it's kept in place because they're humongous. If you are moving like this, it's just an elephant in a, in a, in a, in, in a glass uh, uh, factory or in a, in a China way. Uh -huh. uh, it would destroy everything. Yeah. So anyway, uh, this, floating, this station keeping system, uh, however, does not restrain the movement of the floating structure in the vertical direction. So it allows it to, to move them down due to tidal variation or due to different payloads. So it only restricts again the horizontal uh, direction. So how do you hold something? Just think for a moment, how do you hold something floating out there? You need something like a reaction wall or something to, you know, something uh, that will be anchored down to the seabed. All right. Yeah. So this kind of, of things are called uh, station keeping system. Now, one of the simplest and cheapest way of a mooring system is to have a, a single chain, a chain, and tied to a heavy sinker, could be a concrete block. So, so that is attached to your, to your floating structure. That will hold in place. But obviously, you need more than just one because you yeah. need to create redundancy because just in case, <laughs> just in case if it breaks, you know, it's gone. So you usually have oh, uh, yes. several, yeah, several mooring lines uh, to hold the, the floating structure. But for a ship, for example, when a ship anchors in the anchorage area, they, they only have one chain. Yeah. It's, a, it's called a single board uh, mooring system, SBM. So, uh, so you can imagine a ship 600, 150 meters in length, and then the chain is about 150 meters in length. There's 300 meters in length. Yeah. And uh, because, it's, because it is a single, single uh, mooring system, when there's the current changes, the ship will just pivot around that same point. Yes. Can you imagine the amount of sea space they utilize yeah. you know, to, to model? Because you must allow for this kind of swinging action. Uh -huh. But for, for a volume structure, we do not want them to swing around everywhere. So we try to hold it there. Okay? So, so you can use more uh, uh, mooring chain and sinkers to hold it in position, but it still allow it to move a little bit. But if you do not want it to move at all, then you've got to use much more robust uh, station keeping system yeah. such as using, for example, a caisson. A caisson is just a box that uh, you can float out to, the, to where you, you want it, to, where the floating structure is to be located. You sink this concrete block, you can fill it with, with uh, sand or even sea water, you can fill it up. And then you sink down, but you, you prepare the seabed. The seabed must be hard. Otherwise, if you sink this heavy concrete block down there, it will it will start to move. So you got to, you got to first of all prepare the oh, seabed okay. and sink it down. And then you put your mooring uh, uh, rubber fenders uh, next to your, to the position where your floating uh, uh, platform will be, will be in contact with the, with the uh, caisson. And that will provide a reaction wall. The, the rubber fenders will be able to absorb the energy so that not all the force goes down to the, to the caisson. Otherwise, your case will be so huge if you've got to do that. Yeah. So, um, and you need to resist the horizontal forces because in the floating structure, there's nothing to resist the, the, the horizontal force due to wind, current, and waves. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that resists is the reaction wall, the case on. So you need the case on. Uh, but if your, if your ground, your seabed is not hard enough, it's soft, then you cannot use case on because when you put a case on, it just mm -hmm. grab, by gravity, it sinks down and and that would be detriment to, you know, you can lose your whole entire case on say, where did it go? So you need to use what we call a, a jacket up, a pile, a pile jacket system. And they pile it down, they pile the, uh, into the seabed, into the hard rock. And then on top of this uh, frame uh, with all the piles there, they put a, a mooring head. This mooring head will have these rubber fenders and then we, we attach a collar around this mooring mooring head and this collar attach itself to the floating platform like a collar you know and okay. it will be held in place the floating structure will be held in place so you need to have a few of this just in case if one fails you you the others the others can hold the floating structure still in position so you can also have monopiles simple if, if the if the um if the water depth is not too high um you know you're talking about 20 meters or so you can pile it down, single 
pile, and that pile is your mooring is your mooring dolphin. Then you can put a collar around it, so you okay. get a system of model piles. But if you go further and further out uh, into into the sea and into the ocean, where the water depths are very high, you can't use any of this this system yeah. that I mentioned the caisson or the jacket type, or because when it passes more than you know, 300 meters or 400 meters of water depth, then you go into deep water depth and you would use uh, tethers. These are, these are uh, cables that goes down it, uh, to the bottom of the seabed and anchored itself there. So these cables are attached to your, to your, they call it tethers, attached to your floating structure. Okay. And the floating structures, yeah, will move like an inverted pendulum. You'll swing back and forth like that. Yeah, but it is hell in place. But these are very, because it, um, the, the tethers, they are very economical for, for, for large water depths. If you were to put a concrete or whatever, it's, it's no, just it's too much. Expensive, and yeah. then, um, yes, and then uh, on the other hand, if it is very, very, very deep, you don't even bother to put any mooring system. You will put a, what we call a thruster, a propeller, a thruster in the, in the floating structure that will just move itself like, like a ship propelling itself. So okay. if it's very, very deep, you do not even have any mooring system. You use a thruster system. Okay. And that will enable to keep its position uh, in around that location. So you might let it drift for a while and it drift to a, to a place where, well, it's a, a bit too far from where, where you are. Mm. You can use thruster to, like a, a propeller, to slowly bring it back to its position. Okay. Yes. Wow. And you have a patent for something called gel cells. Ah, yes. Okay, <laughs> let me explain to you. It's okay. a little bit, uh, uh, yes, it's a bit mysterious what's this gel cells. It's not the. <laughs> so, uh, what happened was that I was commissioned by uh, the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore to look into the feasibility of having a floating container terminal. I mean, wow. you, you know your, 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 your port terminal, you have these key cranes and stacking yes. it up. So can we, if, if, the, if the water depth is very high, can we have such a floating container terminal? So when I did this uh, study, I came, to, I came to a, I hit a problem because usually you have a, a lot of loads on the center of your floating container terminal. And that's where the stacking yard is. You put all the containers, and these containers are very, very heavy. Yes. In the containers, the 40 foot container, and they pile it up about nine tiers because they want to save space. They put a lot. So, what happens is, your, you know, when you put a lot of load in the center, you get this dishing effect. Yes. The center defects more, and, and the corners kind of flips out, right? Yes. So, yes. Like this. So, then, then because your key cranes are on the edge, your key cranes, if you have this kind of deflection at the edges, the key crane will not work because they need to have a zero gradient. Their rails must be very flat. They cannot bend like that. So yeah. the, the crane and the, your, boom is, you know, your boom is 40 meters. If you kill it, you know, the, the whole thing, it just cannot work. So therefore, how do I, the question is, how do I even up this deflection, right? Oh. So the reason that, that that sets me thinking, if you have uneven applied load on the surface and you have a constant buoyancy force, you are not going to be able to straighten anything on the surface. So what I need to do is I must tweak the buoyancy force. I must disturb the buoyancy force. I must make the buoyancy force also uneven. <laughs> so how do, I, how do I make buoyancy force uneven? You can do a few things. You can make, you can change the draft. That means you have different depths for your floating uh, container terminal. I mean, some parts thinner, some parts are thicker, all right? So that you can different buoyancy. The other way is you can have many, many compartment cells. You can flood the, some of the compartments with, with water. So you got rid of the buoyancy force. Instead of having buoyancy force there, it's no longer, there's no longer buoyancy force because I flood the compartment. But the whole floating structures do not sink because I flood only certain compartments. Uh -huh. So what I do is that if you got a dishing wow. effect so what I need to do is to flood the compartments at the corners Yay. for example so when I flood the compartments at the corner I use the buoyancy force this thing as it bends backwards it, because of the stiffening effect this, this center portion lifts itself up 
and it become very very flat. Uh -huh. I can make it very flat by doing proper calculation. I can make it as flat as you want. So, oh, wow. so, so this idea of flooding a compartment, uh, I, I gave a, a a very sexy name called gill cells because they are cells, compartment cells, and they are gills because they let the free passage of water going in and out freely. Wow. There's no active control. Uh, so this is something that we could use in a, in a floating structure application where if your load suddenly, you put one side more than the other side. So, so your whole floating structure tilts this way. So what you do is you flood this side so you, you bring it back to even kill. The, the face so in a way, hmm. Sorry, go on. Yeah, so in a way you can, you can make it evenly distributed. The whole idea is this. In every floating structure, you want it to be as flat as possible. You want the load to be evenly disputed load so yeah. that the buoyancy balances itself out. So the structure can only move up and down nicely without bending. Now, yeah. if there's no bending, there's no stress. Stress yeah. only comes from bending. If yeah. there's no bending, there's no stress. Yeah. So you can you know, there's no cracking. You can't crack something that it doesn't bend. You see, when you bend, some parts are in tension, some parts are in compression. If you bend like that, so the bottom part will crack. But if I don't bend, there's no cracking. Yes. So, there you are. You can make your structure strong and durable. How is this connected to tunnel liquid continuum dampers? Because I also saw that they are a mechanism for stabilizing platforms mm. by yeah. creating a tunnel like this. That mm -hmm. feels well, the Japanese use the tin liquid dampers or liquid dampers on the high-rise building to damp the, uh, the vibration of the, of the buildings. Now, there's even a better way. You, you make the, the fluid, instead of just going from one column to the other column, you, put a, you have to pass through an orifice. You make a small hole so that the water had to squeeze through it. So that way, you can, by adjusting the, the orifice size, you can control how much it goes up and down, and you can you can you can reduce the uh, yeah you can reduce the, the the movement by a lot. Yeah, liquid damper is something that uh, is it can be considered to to reduce the rolling action and so on of, of the structure. Uh, and ships use ballasting effects as well in their thing. So uh, it's like uh, sometimes. Uh, uh, they say that uh, you got to have some, if you have some kind of baffle plates that allows the, instead of water, water level free edge go from one end to the other, that's very destabilizing. But if you have many, many uh, walls, with holes, then it will stabilize your, 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 your floating structure. I can see so that. Means of, yeah, means of stabilizing yeah, the, the structure. Oh. Something that I saw a lot that I saw in your work that really caught my attention is that you are looking into graphing oxide reinforced concrete to yes. make to increase the resi the strength of the concrete. Yes, I think this is something that yes, everyone is trying to to make concrete as durable as possible. As you know, concrete fails by cracking. Yes. So if you do not want concrete to fail you must prevent cracking. Uh, and, uh, and concrete is very weak in tension. That's why it cracks. So that's why you put steel reinforcing bars to take the tensile forces. So with whichever parts of the concrete is in tension, you put the, the, the steel bars. So the steel bars take away the, the, the tensile forces. All right? The concrete handles the compression. So some people say, well, we put steel fibers in. Steel fibers, they are very, very tiny uh, steel wires they put inside. The, the fibers redistribute the, the tensile stresses among themselves. That's also very good. That is at the macro level. But then if you want to go and disturb the, the cement, cementitious material at the, at the micro and nano level, you need something very, very small. And now we can go to that small level using carbon nanotubes, graphene oxide and all that. What they do really do there is at that level, you see, cracks must start from at some point. That's what they I start mean. Very, very, very down at the nano level, they start the cracks start to, to appear there. So if, if we can stop it from, from you know, the onset of cracking at that level, then you never crack. 
we would we will you know we will make the, the the concrete very very strong because if it cannot crack it will not fail. So this this carbon nano tips and graphene oxide what they do is that they 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 they, they have these contact areas where they they because they're very small they have all these bendable forces and all that that try to hold on to the atoms you know and they're very very small. So so when things want to open up because they are very, very small, the forces there are very, very great, the atomic forces. They pull them together. They hold it tight. So you can imagine everybody's, you, you want to pull apart this two person, I just hold you tightly. And <laughs> by the moment I let go, the whole thing just goes, right? But as uh -huh. long as I'm there, and the carbon atoms are very strong. Uh -huh. they, the tensile strength is 60, 63 gigapascal. Um, and, and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, Young's models is one deeper pascal, very very high, several orders that uh, uh, um, of of the concrete. So they are very very strong and they're very durable, and they don't they don't corrode. Carbon can corrode, so they are there to make the the concrete very very strong against cracking. Not only that, because they are very small, they fill up the the all the void spaces, yes. preventing preventing water ingress, and also that you know they 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 increase the uh, what we call the uh, surface uh, contacts because they are very small they go everywhere they, 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 they hold things together so it's like you know uh, it's forming a, a a system of cobwebs can you imagine cobwebs all over there so they all all tie each other by these cobwebs and the graphene oxide is like cobwebs there they're just pieces of sheets very very small sheets all over but the problem is this: uh, in this kind of uh, nano particles, we do not want them to agglomerate. They may stick to one place. They want to, you want to disperse. That's one of the problem. How to and make that's them disperse? Problem, right? And, 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 yeah, on a large scale. When you spread it on a large scale, you want to make sure that they are spread evenly. You don't want to have lumps and lumps of these guys. Yeah. No. So they have to be treated chemically and all. But these are expensive because when you start to do all these things, they're very expensive. Yeah. So I think uh, it's still an infancy. We need to to make it cheaper and make it easier um, for, for full-scale deployment of such a uh, cementitious uh, nanos, nano uh, composites, they call it. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, what you want to do is to come up with a kind of impervious waterproofing uh, in the skin for the concrete. If you can do that, you, you, know, you solve the problem because you get to the concrete in, internally and to the steel to to corrode it, you need to go through the skin first, right? So you make the skin impervious and durable. Yeah. If you can do that, then you solve your problem. So people have been looking at all this. They have Germany and have invented all kinds of skins or for these things. And, and they are, of course, everything will last up to a certain time. Some can only last several years, some can, can a bit longer, but eventually they, they will corrode away. But what we need to find is, is it possible for a more durable skin? If we can do that, that'd be great. And then we don't have to worry about, you know, continually uh, uh, replenishing this skin. And, uh, but there's another school of thought. Because, con because reinforced concrete or pre-stressed concrete, um, they, it, when you deploy in the seawater, uh, they worry about the corrosion of the steel reinforcing bar pre-stress tendons. So if we can somehow delete that away from there, from having them there, then we don't have to worry about corroding, right? Uh -huh. So they think of replacing it with some kind of glass fiber reinforced uh, polymer. You know, just yeah. a, they're made of glass fibers. They're very strong. They make it into a rod. You, you, I can't even bet it. It's very, very stiff. So if you put it there, you cannot corrode. So if you can't corrode, then you can also do this. So you, you don't have to use fresh uh, water, sand, you can use sea sand, even with, with all the calcium and, and, and chloride there, no, no problem. If you have, uh, um, you know, uh, use sea water to mix with your concrete, there's no problem because there's no steel for you to, to corrode if you use glass fiber reinforcement. Oh. So there is a, a new idea of people trying to get into this uh, whether we can use sea sand, sea water, and glass fiber reinforced uh, reinforcing bars to build concrete uh, structures for marine purpose, for marine applications. 
that is that's that's something uh, that people are working at. And there's another very interesting discovery. Uh, I think there's an American uh, materials engineer, and he, and she studied um, the Roman concrete, and they discovered this Roman concrete, which is made of some volcanic ash okay. and some volcanic rocks, and they use seawater in the process of making this. They apparently they form a compound. I've forgotten the name of this compound. It's starting with T, tobolomite or something. It's, it has that kind of name. And apparently it is so strong, it, it, holds the, it holds the concrete together, preventing any cracks from happening. And, wow. and that's why they can last thousands of years. Incredibly, this, this Roman concrete. So there's a lot of now studies being made to, to see whether there could be replacement of this volcanic ash, like using fly ash and other kinds of things. Wow. And, and with other uh, chemicals to make this, this, this compound that is so strong. Wow. It's like it forms crystal that are so strong to hold everything together. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting research being carried out, all with the, with the, uh, with the view to apply it on marine structures for... To, end, to lengthen its design life and its lifespan. And how does a day in your work happen? Because I know that you model continuum mechanics, right? But mm -hmm. do you also do work in the lab? How is a day in your work? Oh, how's my day in the work? Yeah. Okay, I have a, right now in the University of Queensland, I have a team of, uh, of eight uh, PhDs and postdoc fellows. And um, they are working in different areas. Some work in the area of uh, strengthening of uh, old um, bridges. Uh, some of the bridges are 50, 60 years old and they need some repair strengthening. Okay. Uh, some of my students are working in the area of uh, floating fish farms. We are trying to create a, a completely new concept of offshore fish farms. Uh, another one is, of course, working in the float. Uh, two of them are working on floating forests because one work on the forest, the other one work on the break. Uh, yes, on the on the on the breakwater, and then I have students work on, on discrete um, lattice models for structure analysis. We discover that a lot of things down in the nano level are discrete anyway. They are not continuum. There's no continuity in on the mm -hmm. nano level, everything is discrete. Yeah. Even the water, right you now. can see they are like, you know, they are a circle of molecules of water. They don't, they don't move like a stream. They, yes. they move in packets. Yes. And, and even Time. gold, yeah, and gold, so, so. Fine. at the nano level, gold does not behave uh, in a very, very um, malleable way. It becomes very brittle and also it's not as inert as people think. It can be a catalyst at the nano. So things changes down there. Besides improving the tensile strength, uh, increasing the heat dissipation, or being more resist, more hydrating, what yeah. other properties have you found that concrete reinforced with graphene oxide can have, as opposed to normal concrete that we use in our daily life? Yeah, of course, we discovered that the mechanical properties is improve a lot. It can also have the thermal uh, properties uh, and, and electrical properties. Uh, I actually, um, we could, um, I think that one of the key things is, is to really be able to withstand uh, the onset of cracking. So to prevent the onset of cracking is critical. Yeah. I think that's an important discovery that we can use nano in those days, there's no way we can put this metal. We, could, we didn't even know such uh, material exists. Uh -huh. But these materials, I think it, is, it opens up a new a way of thinking that we can prevent you know, cracking even at that nano level. There's something very, very special. Wow. Mm. What other uses for nanocomposites you find that we can use on cysteads? For example, because it, they are, graphene sheets are really interesting because they are, they allow the passage of life, of light. They are also stronger than diamond. Mm -hmm. They are really good electrical conductors. So mm -hmm. what uses do you find for other mm -hmm. nanomaterials or graphene on systems? You know, there's, 
It's a very, very interesting uh, uh, paper in, uh, published in, I think, Nature, either Nature or Science. They use this kind of balls that inside the spherical balls, they have smaller balls in there. Okay. And, and the balls, when in wave, as they move in waves, this inside this ball rub against the, the small balls, internal balls rub against the, the external balls. And they, they can produce, if they're dielectric electric kind of materials, they can produce charges. So from mechanical, from mechanical motion, we can get electricity out of it. And, and if you have many millions of this, you know, and, and they are very, very, there's no, there's no, uh, in, in a sense, mechanical parts to wear down because it's just a ball within a ball and they are, they are made of, you know, uh, kind of uh, rubber-like things. So uh, you, can, you can generate electricity from that. But the question is how to generate enough electricity. That's what we're trying to figure out. Mm. And how far they should be placed so that when the waves come, they just, just, just wave back and forth. And while they're waving back and forth, they are generating a lot of electricity. Yes. So that's this application of this nano yes. very small particles inside there as well. We can, you know, enhance it, enhance the amount of electricity we can collect from that. But you know, there's I think the um, the study of this is is going to reveal a lot of interesting applications that we are now at the verge of just getting excited. We don't know enough yet, but as we, we investigate more and more, we discover we can do a lot, a lot more things, yeah. Improve, for example, photo well tech. Uh, in terms of efficiency and many, many other things, yeah. So uh, they have been used in many, many uh, uh, structures to give that strength and yet lightness. You know? For example, you, now you have carbon fiber um, bicycles, race bicycles that yes. can move very fast. They have nanoparticles that you put into, into clothes that uh, will form a, a natural canopy, like a forest canopy, that when a water droplet falls on it, it just, it just, yeah, just, yeah. just, <laughs> just, just drop off, yeah. So yeah. it's almost waterproof and uh, you can wear your most expensive branded, uh, you know, <laughs> coat around without worrying about being wet. With no spills. So, so these are things that they are doing. A lot of very fascinating. That would be amazing. So I, now that you mentioned this, I want to ask, I, I have here some notes. I don't know if asking this question or not, but I read that single wall carbon nanotube. So we have zero dimensional, uh, so we have nanoparticles. Then if you mm. go to one dimension, you have fibers, and then we're talking about a two dimensional uh, graphene. Mm. So single wall uh, carbon nanotubes, can be can dissipate a lot of energy, like you are saying, and you connected it also to its you, its application system. So this might look, this might not be right at all. And but, do you imagine that we could find a way to use this energy dissipation in the most efficient way possible? To, for example, create a platform for assisted, where by people's motion, it can simply generate energy? Hmm. Yeah, it's possible that, you know, uh, they are working using dielectric elastomers that, that allows mechanical action to be, to be changed or converted to electrical energy. Uh, the, uh, the, the Israelis have, you know, have put this kind of uh, uh, concept into, the, uh, into harvesting energy from roads and where they, they have this hum. all this, you know, especially near the container terminal ports, all these big trucks have to go across uh, from one point to another point. So they put all these things, they, as the truck goes over this, so imagine uh, you get a lot, of, yes. a lot of work done, right? So you do some kind of mechanical action, compressing the, the material, and then they set up these materials, when they contract, they set up some charges, and these charges are collected, and that's electricity for you. So um, that, that is something that we definitely, I mean, single wall carbon nanotubes are uh, very good in use in miniaturized uh, electronic systems and so on. So maybe we can use it for sensoring um, and, and build these sensors into our, yeah, miniaturized thing into our floating structure platform that will give a signal telling us that, you know, how our floating structure is performing right now. Am I in, am I in stress right now? Which part of, of my 
clothing structure is very stressed, I can go check up and see whether anything wrong with it and, 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 and come up with a proper remedy for, for solving the problem. So I think it can be used for censoring and for, you know, uh, for extracting energy and so on. So I think this is still in its infancy. I do not know enough to be able to comment deeply into this thing. But I'm sure that some of my other colleagues uh, in this area of carbon nanotubes will be able to tell you even more exciting things than what I'm telling you. Now, this is already a very exciting for me. Yeah. And I'm sure it's for a, everybody who's listening to us. Yes, yes. I think there's a lot of things to, to yet to, to discover in this area of nanostructures, how to use it in, in, a, in, a, in the best possible way. Well, it's a very young field. It's like 10 yes. years? Yes. I, yes, it's, it's la less than 20 years. Well, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Because we never heard of this in 30 years ago. I've never heard of nanomaterials. It's only in the recent times. Yeah. Oh. In, 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 uh, found this carbon nanotube. So it's only 1991 that this thing wow. appeared. And, and, and graphene sheets is even earlier, uh, even, even uh, more later, I mean in the discovery so it's very very in its infancy now as we know more and more of this more such applications will will emerge in our newspaper and we can read about that yes or in our scientific journals yes of course yes. <laughs> um we are almost over with the time but i want to go back to the high level vision and mm -hmm. ask you why are or in which ways are floating structures, how do they relate to tackling problems of the nexus such as energy, water, waste, life mm. form, or? Yeah. Yes, I, I, these are all top problems that humanity faces currently yeah. and in the near future. Energy, water, uh, and the environment, uh, poverty, you know. Uh, and I believe that we can find solution in the ocean if we go to the ocean. Uh, not only that, uh, you know, we can use our advanced technology together as we go into the ocean to find a solution. Now, for example, energy. In fact, we got a lot of energy stored in the ocean, um, especially the sun energy is stored in the, in the ocean. Not all are reflected to outer space. Quite a lot has been sucked into the ocean. Yes. So on the, on, the, on, the, on the top surface of, of the ocean, temperatures are around about 24 degrees Celsius. If you are looking at the water body between the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, okay. usually the temperature is about 24 degrees. And they, they are 24 degrees all the time, day, not, day or night. Now, if you go down one kilometer below the, the ocean surface, the temperature drops to about 4 degrees Celsius. So you have a 20 degrees differential temperature change between the top surface and the bottom. Oh. So we could use uh, this concept of OTEC, ocean thermal energy conversion, where we use liquid ammonia and liquid ammonia boils at a very, very uh, low temperature to about 24 degrees Celsius. It will create a so lot of boiling action. Oh, wow. And when liquid ammonia boils, it changes to a gaseous state and the volume expand by 640 times. Oh. And when you expand by 640 times, you confine in the chamber, you put it in a very small chamber, there's a lot of pressure. Yes. So you allow this, this, this uh, gas to, to go through a small little uh, uh, cavity. Yes. And, yes, and then you create a, a strong jet. Yes. Uh, uh, that will can drive a turbine. And that turbine gives you electricity by turning the turbine. now. Then we take part of that energy that we have extracted and use a riser, which is a vertical pipe, put four, about one kilometer down to the ocean floor. And we use the energy to, to extract the ocean um, cold water, about four degrees, with, rich with nutrients. We pump it up to the top surface. We cool the liquid ammonia back to... <laughs> Uh, the, the gaseous ammonia back to liquid ammonia and the cycle goes round and round. Wow. Not only that, but we, but we also uh, uh, use the, the water nutrients, uh, the ocean, uh, you know, about one kilometer below, there's a lot of nutrients. And that's, that's a lot of food for fish. 
you can cultivate fish farms as well in, in, in that OTEC plant. So you can do it day and night continuously and that's endless energy, endless. And there's no carbon, no worries about radioactivity if you're worried about you know, nuclear plant and so on. There's no radioactivity, no carbon. There's no carbon in the equation. You can also do this. You can also use a vacuum and you know, put the seawater and seawater boils at a very low temperature uh, when you, you, you have a vacuum. So when the water boils, you produce steam, right? Now, you can use steam engine. Steam can use to, oh. to drive steam engine. Not, and and when steam, when steam uh, condenses, what do you get? You get fresh water. So you get fresh water and you get power as well. Ooh. Yeah, so you can use that concept. Now, there's a lot of, and i just give you an illustration. You can get a lot of energy from just the solar energy stored in the ocean. But you can also get energy from the wave and from the, from the tidal currents. You know, the wave is endless. If you stand on the shoreline, you see the waves coming. Endless, forever. So we can use wave energy converters, you know, with PTO's uh, uh, push takeoff uh, systems to extract the, the, the because when you, when you have parts that rotate against each other, then you can push the hydraulic fluid and the hydraulic fluid uh, is able to, uh, you know, turn oh. things and so on. So you can get electricity from there. Also, you can, you can get uh, a lot of wind energy from the ocean. Actually, you get more wind in the ocean than in the, on land. So your wind turbine can be made several times more than your land-based wind turbine. They can be huge, humongous. But now is the, the problem is how to make them cheaper. If you can get it cheaper, you can get a lot, lot more power. And, and also you can have floating solar farms out there because there's no shadow cast on the ocean. You can get all the light that you want and then the ocean water is cool. So efficiency of the photovoltaic is improved tremendously. So you can get a lot of energy. Then that's, so you can solve the energy problem there. You can also solve your water problem. People fight over water because nowadays water is very scarce and sometimes it doesn't rain in the right place. Yes. You know? And, and people have to use pipelines from mountains far, far, hundreds of kilometers away to bring the water to the city. You know, like Beijing, they get the water from Hebei forest very far away. Oh. So in terms of calm, water is a problem. But if you go into the ocean, the ocean contains 97% of the water of the world, 97%. <laughs> the other 2% are in ice caps, you know? And then you got a couple of 1% in the in the soil, in the aquifer, and only point something, something, zero, zero, five percent that we are using uh, water for our, our daily use. But 97% is in the ocean. We can use desalination. If you've got energy, you can do everything. You can do desalination using reverse osmosis or whatever. Or you can boil the seawater and condense the water and you can get the you know, fresh water. So in the, in the ocean, you can also put artificial reservoir. You can create huge confinement and, and during rain you can collect this rainwater in the ocean just like you collect you can collect the rain in the, and the land in your lakes you can uh-huh. also create, create fresh water lakes in the ocean wow yeah you can do that oh. you know, also you can now to, to, uh, and also for example in in the area of creating the jobs when you, when you go to the ocean, there's a $500 billion industry right now, the blue economy, but it will expand as we, yes. uh, the ocean utilization uh, you know, uh, gets underway and uh, more and more people move to the ocean and, and, and take advantage of so much resources there. Yes. Uh, you can create jobs like building uh, aquaculture farms, uh, um, you know, sea farms. Uh, you can have, uh, you know, um, creation of cities, um, townships. Um, you know, people are living on cruise ships for weeks on a boat, on a huge boat, and they love it. Why don't you can, you can live there forever? If you want, we can create even a much bigger boat. I mean, a, flatting, a flat land that spans kilometers by kilometers. You can jog and do whatever you want. You can have internal lakes inside there, whatever you want. Yes. So we can create countries do that so they, that could create new jobs yeah. and a new you know way of of extracting uh, uh food uh energy water 
from the ocean. Those are new jobs. I mean, jobs that are not there, but now becomes available. It wasn't there, but you create something from nothing. I so know. that's great. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, and food is something that we always, it will be a problem. So as, as um, things get more and more polluted on the land, uh, then you, you know, if you want to go into the ocean, you get very, very uh, clean, clean waters and so on. You don't have contaminated river water. And so on. Yes. You, can, you can farm very, very high quality crops with fresh water, which I mentioned to you, we're using energy that we extract from the ocean. We can, we can get fresh water and farm our, our, our crops there. And, and they provide food, not only that, you get seafood. And seafood is very, very, very good for your health. And actually, it's better than eating yes. great. You know? and, it is. And, 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 and you don't farm fish on land. It's ridiculous to farm fish on land. People think of farming fish on land. It's crazy. Let's farm fish in this ocean. It's a natural right. place. And yes. it's clean. Yeah, and, 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 and the fish grows well in the natural habitat. Exactly. Uh, so we can, we can create huge tuna farms, kilometers by kilometers, not restricted by small little space. We can make it very big because the ocean is so big. 70% of the earth's surface is covered by ocean. There's plenty, plenty. Yeah. Even though you take up so much, you still got plenty, plenty. Yeah. It is endless. So I think, by the way, only 5% of the ocean has been explored. 95% is not known. We have figured out that there are 230,000 species wow. living in the ocean. But that's based on 5% of the of the ocean that is explored. So wow. we believe that at least 2 million species of, of you know, living animals living in the ocean, we, most of them we have not seen or, or even know of. You know, every day we see, we see new creatures being found in the ocean. Yes. That's yeah. right. So this is something very, very interesting that the ocean contains so much richness of biodiversity that we have yet to know. Yeah. So I think, I think going to the ocean is something that eventually every human being will, will gravitate to naturally in time to come. If not now, later on, they will figure this out. Because it's, a natural, it's a natural progression you know, from, from this to that. Yeah. But once we figure out how to create artificial land, we can live on the ocean. Because at the moment, we can't live in the ocean since we don't have gills to breathe and so on. We need to be on the surface. So if once we figure out how to live on the surface by creating these pontoons and land, then we can, we can go to the ocean. Like, just like traveling from one point to another on land, we can do it in the ocean. Exactly. And we can also have buildings that have underwater floors. Yes, you can have, uh, yes. You can have structures and then you have basement and uh, the basement goes down into the, uh, uh, into the seabed and sea floor. And that's what we've been done in the horse, horseshoe, uh, is it called a seahorse? No, I'm sorry, the seahorse floating houses in Dubai. They sell each for two, two million or something, a few million dollars. Okay. And they have this upper floors and below the, the master bedroom, it goes down and then the curtain opens up, they can see the corals. Yeah. And also the, yeah. And also, Norway has just opened an underwater restaurant where they, they have a box like that and they just, they oh, just immerse okay. the other end into the, into the, into the fjords, water body and so on. That they can enjoy the, the, the sea view or fjord view while they're dining. So, they have, they have all these things are coming up. Yeah. And very, very exciting times. Okay. So have I answered all your questions? You have answered absolutely all my questions, Professor Wong. Thank you very, yes. very, very much. Yes. I, my pleasure. My pleasure. You. And okay. see you in a month so, in Brisbane. We'll see you in a month. Okay, yes. let me know. I will. Have Bye. a great day. Bye. Okay, goodbye. Okay. Bye. Thanks for joining us on the Blue Frontiers podcast. To learn more about our work and find out how you can support the project, visit blue-frontiers.com or visit our social channels. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Blue Frontiers, or shoot us a note via our website. If you learned something and enjoyed the show, tell a friend or leave us a positive review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Don't forget to subscribe to our show and remember to join us for the next episode. See you next time.